Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 10 a.m. session in the Business and Enterprise Track. As a reminder to our in-world and web audience, you can view the full conference schedule at conference.opensimulator.org. And tweet your questions or comments to at OpenSimCC with the hashtag OC, excuse me, OSCC14. This hour, we are happy to introduce a terrific session called Virtual Reality in the Enterprise. Our speaker today is Julie Lemoyne, the founder of 3D ICC, which offers the enterprise-grade turf immersive virtual reality environment. She was also the founder and head of the Fidelity Center for Applied Collaboration, a four-time E2.0 speaker on social media. Welcome all, and let's begin the session. Hi, and, uh, everyone, and thanks for coming to the talk. Uh, I appreciate the intro, and I, I feel a little gun-shy given the, uh, the last talk we just had with such amazing women uh, in, in uh, VR, but uh, let's, let's get going. So I, I would imagine that many of you may or may not know me at all, um, and I was the former founder and creator of the Center for Applied Collaboration at Fidelity Investments, but most people are pretty interested in some of the things I've done um, like my work for NASA, making sure that people could not uh, hack the space shuttle software and other things like that. So I've had quite the illustrious career uh, in technology, almost 30 years now, I hate to admit and love to admit at the same time. It was at the very early days of collaboration that I started getting into like, even virtual reality gloves way back in the 90s. Um, but I have done a lot of things that have influenced what I'm about to show you. Um, I have spent my entire career in enterprise and in large organization and government work. And so all of that work and my information security background and uh, my interest in advanced collaboration have all sort of culminated to get me to this point. So I think knowing a little bit about me is, is worthwhile to know why would you listen to me about enterprise? Um, not just that last job at Fidelity Investments where I was a fellow there and uh, led a lot of their strategy on lots of different types of collaboration. Um, I also um, have the pleasure of working with women who are entrepreneurs, and I helped Simmons in Boston, I'm in uh, Boston, Massachusetts these days, um, understand the reality of being a startup, because I'm a serial entrepreneur, I've owned six companies. So all of these sort of, it, the reason I bring this up is if you stir this into a mixing pot, um, that should help you believe some of the things that I have to say to you today. Um, so the first thing I would tell you about VR and the enterprise um, is that it's not really about, and I hope the audience, uh, if you're an immersive environment type uh, open sim lover, um, that you understand that it really isn't about location transparency for companies. So we spent a solid decade in interaction and engaging platforms um, that are amazing, like Adobe Connect and the WebExes of today. Um, but the, the notion that we need location transparency in the organizations where I worked and those that I advise is really sort of misinformed. Um, and so the truth is that when you give human beings a location, even if it's a virtual location, you are really assisting them and their teams and their learning and their knowledge and their outreach and their interdependence. Uh, and so it's very, very vital to think about, I think, the step that we're, we're in and the step that was created in the beginning um, as really, really important in the beginning of the days of immersive environments as really important and starting to lead the way. Um, and as hardware has gotten to the point where it is, it's much more reasonable for um, enterprise to start using it um, as well. For anyone that's interested in this area, I think um, there's there's been so much work about the notion of virtual distance. Um, but I, in the enterprise space, I found that Karen Sobel, the Jeskis work on the um, um, unifying the virtual workforce, her book in that area was fantastic. Um, and you know, it's an older book, it's a couple of years old, but it's really, really worth a look if you haven't seen it. Um, so, so I just like to push on that point that it, we're not looking for location transparency, we're looking to create a location where we can be together. And I think that's really critical when you speak to enterprise. Uh, the other thing that I would like to bring to the table is enterprise is doing a lot with virtual reality. And I, I think it's worth a moment to say, you know, virtual reality is many things. Like we are in an immersive environment, as you know, those that are standing here are watching it. But um, with the dawn of amazing 
um, advances like Google Glasses and Oculus Rift and, and more of the head-mounted um, heads-up display, um, you know that these uh, the sort of left side that I'm showing here with the crazy people sitting in the cinema with their paper glasses, you know, has really evolved over the last 20 to 25 years. Um, and I, um, every single one of the images on here from the teaming to the presenting, to the managing, to the serving, to providing services, um, you're looking at a virtual branch at the bottom there, a financial branch. Um, uh, the manage is, you know, trades, um, uh, is call center management, uh, teaching, presenting, pitching, teaming. So all of this is being used by enterprise today. I know that because my company services um, companies that are in the Fortune 10, in the Fortune 20, in the Fortune 100, 500, down to smaller companies as well. So we are supporting retail companies, financial organizations, government agencies, our, our largest company at company um, that we support at 3D ICC is actually not a company, it's the US government. So we are working diligently with tens of thousands of army um, uh, members as well. So I, I think there's just a lot to the notion that, you know, VR isn't just in the gaming industry. And it's not that the gaming industry and the entertainment industry isn't a power pack here. You know, they're, they're leading us through consumer use in this area. But um, I just wanted to bring up some of the use cases that are going on. And I have some very specific ones a little bit later in the talk. All right. So I wanted to talk, you know, I, actually kudos out to Maria who had suggested some of what I might speak about. And I know she's here to, to read some of the questions that are ongoing. Um, so I appreciate the input that you said, you know, talk about the barriers, talk about what's what's actually going to hit people when they're working with enterprise. And I also want to acknowledge that this isn't some new topic, right? So I, you know, at the Center for Applied Collaboration where I worked at Fidelity, um, I was in charge of the work that we did in Second Life, in Wonderland, in all of, in, in Active, in OpenSim, in, all, in Active World, in all of the environments. So we did a lot of work as a financial institution back, you know, in the early days uh, of the grid. So, um, and then the work that I did in, a long time ago was at the MITRE Corporation and, and working with virtual reality gloves and, and the first uses of online collaboration. I even worked with CUC me and that kind of technology. So, um, so let me talk about the kinds of barriers that you will hit if you're if you're thinking about it. And I, I like to say anytime I can put um, Morpheus on a slide, I'm happy. So, um, so in the first area that's very very real is the difference between using VR as a tool and VR as recreation. And and I think. You, you have to take your head if you're not an enterprise, 100% enterprise background kind of person um, and make sure that you understand that there's a big difference here. So that I'm going to bring up three ways in which they're very different. Uh, the first way is user motivation. When you think about user motivation, um, recreational, the user is motivated to use it for entertainment. When you think about the use motivation, for the use in enterprise, business, organization, even education, it's very specifically focused on getting something out of it, getting learning, retaining knowledge, reducing you know, costs, et cetera. So they're very different approach to the reasons for which they are using uh, virtual reality of any kind. So I think that is very important to, to wrap your head around. The second one is the value proposition. So with recreation, the value proposition is basically entertainment. And so you're going to pay the amount of money that you want for entertainment, for enjoyment, for, for that kind of side of it. The value proposition for work and, and for learning and for organizations such as governments is, uh, you know, is many fold, but none of it is entertainment. I mean, they don't mind if you're entertaining somebody while they're getting more retention, reducing costs. Um, you know, reaching more customers, putting out better PR, looking great, looking intelligent. But truly, they are not just there to try to entertain you. And again, you know, if you're if you're just coming in now, uh, you know, entertainment is a very big business. It's all business. So, but I'm just talking about the non-entertainment use of VR. Um, the the final one that is interesting is is you know harkens back to a couple of them is fun versus ease. 
So I like the the notion of, you know, put the banana in the bucket, put the banana in the bucket. This is very difficult. What a what a difficult boss to beat, right? Even with my, you know, my Oculus, I can't beat this boss, right? So the the reality is sometimes the difficulty with which um, environments are designed is overtly done for entertainment purposes, and it is the opposite for uh, use in enterprise. And so when, you know, these these are that like tool versus recreation area, it is so important to put your head on straight when you're talking and speaking and working in enterprise about the, the, um, the, the tool style value of VR. So the, the second big barrier sort of category is culture. And, you know, that's a really easy word to say. Well, oh, yes, culture is important. It's a pushback. But it isn't just, oh, yes, culture. You really do need to consider that who in the organization that you're dealing with, whether it's a corporation, a university, a government, uh, or some other organization, who are you affecting? And, and so if you, if you run through things like personas and understand who you're talking to and who might be affected, you'll, you'll quickly come up with a list of people, you know, like my previous one, tool versus recreation, that have to change the way that they think about doing everything that they're doing. So uh, understand that it isn't just this, these tools will make you more X or Y, they will save you money. They may save them money, but only if, if the personas that have to use the environment, you know, sort of get the hang of it. And so that the culture pushback can be very, very real, but you can't just sort of say, oh yeah, you know, this is new. This is, you know, I, I think um, I spoke for many years on social media uh, back in the, back in the days when I was running that center at Fidelity and, and the, so what of it all is going to come faster in enterprise than it is, you know, on the consumer side, because consumers will try things out and put their money down for that. But in the enterprise side, you know, the, so what has to be given to them up, up front. So what do you get? Right. So so it's very, very uh, powerful. The other thing that's very powerful in enterprise. And if you haven't sold to enterprise before in real advanced innovation is the shiny new thing. So if it is interesting, there's going to be all kinds of people that come out of the woodwork to own it. So what I would say to people that are trying to sell to enterprise um, is that be prepared to let someone else be the one that thought up what you just said to them. <laughs> so, and it, it's very natural. It's very normal. And, um, and you're going to have like, it's going to be like a little kicking ball, like, no, they're going to own it. No, these guys are going to own it and, and all that kind of stuff. So uh, the, the kind of coaching that I used to give to the women that I helped at the Simmons postgraduate MBA program for entrepreneurship is very real in this culture thing. Um, you have to understand what you're doing and how to make the person that you're selling to become the hero. That's uh, just, that's truthful in business and it's true in the gaming uh, aspect as well. Um, the other thing is not all users culturally, I, I mentioned, want to use this, right? So, so even if it's good for them, um, they may not want it. So nothing, nothing unlike um, other culture challenges for innovation that you have seen before. It's very similar to those cultures, but it's there and you can't just be in love with your technology or your craft and and your your science and think that everyone else is going to love it too just because you feel that it can help them right so so i guess I, you know i think my nickname at simmons was the reality bringer so i think that that's the truth here is that you got to deal with reality when you're dealing with enterprise and um and not just with um the the your passion isn't enough you you know you need your passion in order to do your job but you have to show them the you know the ledger if you will. And then just a word about the Hollywood, um, the Hollywood effect. So one of the ways that I combat the Hollywood effect when we sell to enterprise is to be very realistic with our customers and say, look, you know, it's not unlikely for me to quote the, you want a hundred million dollar movie? That's fine. That comes out of Hollywood. You want 80% of that for 60 K? I'm your, I'm your gal, right? Here it comes. Because the, the people using this environment that will get the benefit that I'm describing to you and the use cases and your customers and the outreach and the learning or whatever the use case is, um, can get that kind of impact for, for, for you know, 10% of what Hollywood would put into it or 1% of what Hollywood put into it, into a movie to make it perfect. 
Um, and I think, you know, the, the previous panel, we had a, a couple of illustrious women that study the brain and all kinds of wonderful things. And they would, they would say, here, here, um, you know, you don't have to get perfect uh, reflection location or perfect. You just have to give them the concept that it, they're in the location or they're having the experience. And that's good enough to set the mind of a team that's an agile software development team or a doctor training exercise. It doesn't have to show them the insides of the heart unless they're operating on it. If you're working on doctor finishing their paperwork, then just putting them in a place that sort of looks like a doctor's office will have that active learning effect on them that has been written about for many, many years for you know active learning and active training. So I think those are, these are the three barrier areas that I always try to put forward for folks that are they're saying, how the heck do you sell to enterprise? And, and you know, taking away everything else, I have spent my entire career in enterprise and organization. So I speak enterprise, right? Like I, I didn't come from the consumer side. Um, that said, all of our customers have consumers, right? So it isn't, it's just that most of our sales are B2B and my, my whole career and the folks that I work with have always supported enterprise. All right, so then to take it on very specifically, um, and you know, I think, um, again, I wanna plug, plug Marie on this one again, and she's just like, really give it to them, really tell them, you know, how do you sell to enterprise? And so um, some of these are, are slightly uh, what I would call motherhood for people trying to sell to enterprise over the years, but the, they're all these, but they're still true and nobody um, will believe it until they get deep into it and do this for a living to sell to enterprise, particularly VR, particularly advanced technology. So the first rule, and it's in every Forrester and Gartner and every report you ever read by any analyst and every report that Maria writes that's fantastic, um, is that Rule number one is that the IT organization, when you have advanced innovation, including VR, they are not your target, right? So you do not go after them. Do not, do not be out there trying to sell to the people that are trying to keep, you know, the, the, the enterprise tools such as SharePoint or WebEx or something running. They are not your friend. They are busy and people take away their salaries and they're, they're buried. Right? And in addition to that, the business is a revenue center. So, you know, you want to understand that, that you're just going for share a wallet. And so when you go for share a wallet, you need to go to the people that have a vested interest in making that money. And so be very careful how you approach it. Um, I would say that's the most important rule anybody could ever have. But the other rule kind of goes along with that number two. And I, I made the wallet very big compared to the, um, the total cost of ownership. So if you don't know what TCO is, it's total cost of ownership. Um, and they're gonna ask you that in enterprises and organizations, even at universities, they're gonna say, what does it cost? What is this gonna cost me with the whole cost? What are my startups? What are my, you know, deployment? What's my maintenance? How do I keep this going? And, you know, we all learned, I hope from social media for many, many years that you're looking for your virtuous circle. So you're looking for a reason why the price goes down and the more they put into it and the more they use it, the more they get out of it, the more the price goes down. So, so understand your total cost of ownership and do it for them. And you may hate that idea, the notion that you have to write the cost benefit analysis for your customer because it's really, you're probably working with someone, it's their job to do it. But if you're smart, you'll hand it to them. And, and not, you won't hand them a lie, uh, you'll just hand it to them and um, say, this is clear and make sure that your, your costs are clear, right? Your benefits are in there, your value proposition, your, your hard and soft dollars are in there. Um, but if you don't fess up to all the costs and make it clear and find the ways uh, that you're gonna save money, Remember, with these two rules, you know, don't sell to IT if you can help it and, you know, make sure you give them the cost benefit analysis. Every, every time you turn, you're going to hit rule number three. And that's like, be clear with what you're doing here, because the first thing in number three is you're actually not going to be in competition with another virtual reality capability. No way. You're going to be in competition with the in-place software in an enterprise, in an organization, at a university. So I can't tell you how many times I've walked into um, sales where everything's going very, very great and, and in comes IT and, and rightly so and says, well, okay, we have, you know, WebEx and we have Adobe Connect or we have, you know, like, are you telling me uh, that the dollars that we spend on this, we can take out of spending on that? So be, be aware that your, your tug of war is going to, it's not some other competitor in VR. You're not fighting... You know, if you're a competitor of ours, you're not fighting us. 
you're finding the software that's in place already because this is next generation software for enterprises, right? So this is the next generation of engagement. And so they've got the current in place and they've got an investment in there. Um, so let's see, uh, speak their languages. And then I, the last thing that I would say um, is that I wanna say folks, if, if you wanna hold your questions to the end, I, we'll try to get to them and Maria is gonna look at them. Um, to, to help me out. I'm just going to go through sort of the material and then I'll stop early and I'll take some questions. I got about 10 more minutes um, at the end. Um, so I'm, I'll finish up in about uh, 10 minutes and I'll just open for questions. Um, so um, uh, yes, I, I totally agree. That's what I'm saying about the, the IT folks. So let me not watch the chat. They are totally swamped. That's the reason why they don't want another tool in their hands. 100%. I am from IT, right? So I come from them there so i totally understand it the um all right so let me talk about the fourth rule and i think this is really important to strategy so uh, as a if you haven't been a strategist or haven't been you know it's like a, so i spend a lot of time as a global strategist for advanced technology uh, particularly in engagement for the last 30 years and so the the truth is i don't ever go in anywhere where i don't have a bullseye right a bullseye that has the five six seven nine ten places where i think that this capability could deliver value to the customer because there's no way you want to go in there and say hey i'll help your learning and development organization end of conversation you know like you got to show them that the investment that they make has a carry-on future so i tend to carry uh, an artifact that looks like a little circle bullseye and on the outside it has all the possibilities and then in the middle of the pilots and then in the bullseye are the ones that go you know full on and I think, you know, I learned that game from, you know, sitting in strategy meetings with, you know, the best in the business with Harvard and MIT and big companies, big oil, big, big money and things like that. So, um, so I think that's a really valuable lesson to learn. Don't ever go in there without understanding the multiple ways in which this capability can help this global organization, big or small. So um, just as a quick, I got a couple of other things that, um, that I want to get down to. I want to get to the good and the bad and the ugly. So let me just state these like really quickly. So a, a couple of the use cases that we're in, and this is just a couple, um, it, you know, infinite team rooms, uh, global touchable thinking rooms. So we have uh, Fortune 10s using our software as the glue between very large touchable rooms with six, seven, eight panels in them. And they're doing very complicated market analysis, you know, and then retail, some of them are financial, right? So that's a, that is a big deal. This mix of reality and virtual reality is a big deal when you're a, a very, you know, dealing with white collar, hardcore thinking process kind of thing, right? So I think a lot of us think about this in more of the, the physical industry, but oh no, you add touch and real screens and, and things like that. And it's, it's a big deal there. They're saving time and creating reports faster than they've ever been able to do before. I talked in the previous panel about construction and Dr. Renati Fuchter at the PBL lab has worked with our product for almost a decade. And she is just changing, she and many others, but she is really formidable in changing the construction and architecture industry. So she's her work and the folks that have worked with her and then have gone off to, to modify that industry, it's just starting to hit. Um, and so that's a really big area. And of course, there's a physical side to that, but um, mostly it's process and review and teaming and things like that will save them um, millions and millions each job. Uh, we do affinity workshops, just like you would do in physical. We do global agile teaming. Package design is always surprising to people uh, because in our environment, um, the use of camera, so we just are very reality, virtual reality mixed. Um, so we have physical package design by, you know, consumer goods providers going on and we have infinite wall that they can put their designs, but while they shine their live webcams on what they're working on across the globe, and then they can use things like infinite virtual wall in order to work through designs. Um, so we have uh, micro gaming that's teaching doctors how to stick to clinical trials um, and follow the protocols to save, you know, all kinds of many millions of dollars and um, we have hybrid classes for L&D, really hybrid, where you put a camera and two panels that are touchable and uh, the physical students see the virtual students and the instructor and vice versa. So, so these use cases are very real and we're doing them nonstop. Um, so I wanted to talk overtly about um, 
the heads up display area or the head mounted display area and because I'm asked all the time. And it, at uh, 3D ICC, we just did our internationalization release. So we are multilingual completely now. Um, and so, you know, I got some questions when we put that release out. I got a bunch of customers that said, well, I'm surprised you didn't just announce, you know, your support for Oculus. Um, or, you know, what's what's going on there with your support for HUD in the future? And so I think, you know, the notion that are the working dogs going to gonna wear stuff on their faces, um, I think is very valuable. And I also would remind people that these tools aren't, aren't available other than to developers right now, right? So um, so in, mo in, in the most part, not all of them. Um, and I have a, a, my partner, we're just at the very beginning, right? My, one of my partners, David, is is about to come out with a company called Wearality, you know, that has a 170 degree, you know, view with see-through and all kinds of stuff going on here. So, so sure, I think that in the enterprise, uh, or I don't even have to think, I guarantee you this, they, that so many of our use cases translate to head-mounted displays and head-up heads up display use. But right now, the verticals really matter. Like the interest in it, the verticals really matter. So more physical, the vertical just like prior in a 3D environment when we first started with, with the grids, the vertical really does matter. And if you have a more physical kind of industry, the vertical is going to pick it up faster. And we see that. I mean, we just had Jackie on the panel and, you know, Ford is using, you know, the goggles and, you know, of course, right? So that really matters. Um, and for a lot of things, see-through really matters. So augmented reality really matters as a form of, you know, sort of heads-up display. The, the big point that I would like to make on this entire subject, while we have you know, about a year before this becomes like a reality for everyone in the world to have these glasses more likely, is that the big deal is that the shift is the expectation towards 3D content, right? So put your mind on that, right? The expectation for 3D content is swelling, right? So this has never kind of been there before. It's always like, why do I need it in 3D? Now, certainly I'm speaking from an enterprise perspective, right? So the more that the world is saying, where's your 3D? I need 3D content. I'm used to 3D content. Look at all the noise about the 3D content. Look at all the heads up display, the head mounted displays. I carry it in my pocket. I put my phone in it. You know, I, it's, you know, it's less than $200 for my staff to be able to do this. So believe me, the most important thing that's happening right now to everyone in this audience that works in this field, I think, is the shift towards this expectation for 3D content. And so never underestimate that. That's the real deal here right now. I mean, the right now, right? And so I'm going to move to the next topic on you. And I want to just really be clear that now is not tomorrow. So you can you can quote me on that. I'm profound. So I should, you know, end of talk, right? Now is not tomorrow. Thank you very much. Right? So so, and, and when, I, when I answer the questions, what matters to the enterprise the most? What features matter? It, it's, um, it's almost like I'm afraid to say it to this audience, right? I'm a little bit afraid to tell you the truth here. So think of me as the reality bringer, you know, you can hiss and boo at me in text. Uh, but the truth is the real thing that enterprise is going to ask for, enterprise organization governments, and you guys can probably hear here because many of you are working in these areas I know, is they need solid security. The first thing out of their mouths is, I can't use your product if it's not really got a decent security architecture, right? So that's gonna come out of their mouth. They could love it all they want, right? So solid security, right? And then the next thing they're gonna say is, and you're not an island, even though we are an island, right? So you're not an island. It's like, oh yes, we are. But you have to have connectors and integrators and you have to support what they need native. Like, and this stuff has to be simple. Simple, like simple is too long a word for how simple it has to be, right? So it can't be hard in any way, right? It can't be. It has to be drag and drop and point and click and touch. It can't be anything else. You better be able to put your finger on a PowerPoint and push it into somewhere and show that PowerPoint. Absolutely forget it if you can't, right? So I'm telling you, you know, the simplicity is a big deal, but no matter how simple it is, if it's not secure, they're not going to use it. Right. So, so my, uh, you know, my, my head of engineering, Ron has holds patents in database security for medical stuff. I, I actually was an InfoSec creator in the very, very beginning. So keep, you know, it's very, very kiss, right? You're right. Um, so the other thing that they're really interested in is hybrid. They put a lot of money into their video to the desktop and things like that. And they have to have the hybrid. Sadly, I'm very sad to say this, uh, morphing your avatar, facial gestures, emotes, 
And everybody creating locations is just of no interest to most that I speak in enterprise. None, zip. And remember, I was a customer of all these tools for many years for the number one online trading company in the world. I was a customer. So I so love this industry. I so think there's value and I love the beauty and I'm married to a professional artist. So I love the art, but as an enterprise expert, uh, it is not what they care about. You have to displace reality a little bit and make sure that it's a utilitarian location, right? But they are not going to care, and they do not want belly buttons showing. They care that avatars look like the people. They don't want to be sued because somebody is dressing up like a Native American when they're not one, right? So there's all these sort of culture conflicts with um, the consumer value of our grids, right? So this is a very interesting topic, I think, to most people. Uh, but it's real. So things that can never happen, right? It can never, never, never. And these aren't really uh, the feature set, but the sound issues, intolerable, unacceptable. Sound, forget it. Can't make it. If you have sound issues, you're done, right? So if you slow them down, because because the previous generation of engagement has been there for a while, and they've sort of made themselves powerful in that area. And they've also put servers in house and they've done some really interesting things. And they don't tolerate Skype that well because it does do its up and down and things like that. So um, the other thing that will kill you is pilots that are out of focus, right? So if you don't, if you do a pilot and you don't really know what it's going to deliver and they're not really engaged in it, you got some troubles, right? Because they're, you know, they're busy professionals, whether they're delivering services to customers with your tool or with your environment or whether they're, you know, using it for training or whether they're using it for teaming, they're, they need to know what they're doing, right? So um, the, the last mile networking is going to bite your butt every single time. And they're not going to be very tolerant about it, even though they have to deal with it with every part of their technology at enterprise and organizations. And you have no control over someone working from home and whether they have the latest libraries or whether they've got a good connection or whether something goes down. But let me tell you, when, you're, when your product's in play, uh, it is going to smack you if uh, your end users have trouble, whether you own last mile or not. And you can't just sort of throw up your arms and say, well, that's not us, that's you. It's like, that doesn't work, right? You have to be real about this thing. So I know I'm starting to get close to um, when I wanted to open up for questions. So let me let me talk just a, briefly about the next concepts that I had, um, and then I'll, I'll try to open it up for a little more comments and questions. I wanted to talk a little bit about um, I, what I would call reflective locations. I, I learned a, a new term in the last session, which was wonderful. Um, so I tend to call them, you know, reflective reality, reflective locations. And, and I just use sort of the notion of teaching here. Um, so the notion of paving the cart path, right, for L&D organizations where people sit in a chair like you're doing here and I send my slides up. And the notion of really sort of almost mirror reflection of location, like a doctor's office. But there's that little GC in between that I think from, a, from an enterprise perspective is so very important. And that's what I wanted to bring up here to, to give you a, a push in the positive to say, look, there's this really, really powerful, really easy in between. Right, and so what I'm showing you in this presentation, that if you can see it, is that there, I took honestly a PowerPoint slide. Um, I actually didn't do this, one of, our, one of our customers did. Took a PowerPoint slide, put it on a wall, and three transparent boxes and stood back and asked their students, this was, they were teaching Six Sigma, I think in this class, to go stand where they think the answer is. So that is 1,000 times more engaging than me presenting a slide with data on it because it's active learning and there's so much research on active learning or active participation. Um, again, with the same topic with agile teaming of any kind or design, people can pick up little stickies and put them on walls where they believe they can vote with their feet. There is so much participation for teaming. And if you if you study teaming, uh, the sociology and the psychology of teaming, interdependence is so important. So when you have to take action in order to help someone else in a team meeting, it's really, really, really powerful and it makes teams come together more. So the whole subject of teaming is a very interesting one that I don't have a lot of time to get into today, but I just really push that juicy in between because any kind of action, you know, we are, we work a lot with educational institutions as well. And so the, the, 
death to, you know, sort of education around just the massive use of MOOC, you know, just massive one-way teaching, which is so wonderful and important. But if you don't add that high touch back in, um, you've got to have a very specialized student to stick with it, to learn from it, and not to tune out. And, you know, we're starting to see statistics now that these students are starting to do very poorly on their tests and not not make it through. And, you know, so it's, I think the high touch is really important. When you start moving back to that one-way medium, you got some problems. So to try to start wrapping it up, I just sort of in a nutshell, um, for enterprise, and I, I, we are, we are virtual reality and, and the, all of these types of environments are cost-effective high touch. That's the bot underneath everything, teaming, delivering service, training. We are cost-effective high touch. We are global teaming, we are learning, we are much, much more. And as a social media expert uh, as well, the notion that these play well or not well with social media, they are fantastically connected, right? So the ability to bring higher engagement than text can provide you, right? When wanted. So the jump from you know, a, a community is so real and so important that we are, you know, we're working a lot in that area as well. Um, so I would just say to you, we really are the next round of sort of citizen, student, associate, client, customer engagement. And we've been working up towards this for the last 10 years. I know I've been working it for 10 years and the hardware has finally started catching up to us. I, um, I think we are the children, you know, of the parents that are just coming now, the parents being the devices that are coming to help us quite a bit. Um, so I think that is where I wanted to stop. This is sort of my, you know, impact on enterprise uh, presentation and maybe see if there's any people in the audience that want to ask me any questions. Um, and hopefully I've given you something really interesting. Um, so I see one right now, how, what does high touch mean? So the notion that you have higher quality interaction that engages you in a way that changes your behavior. So, yeah. Um, so Maria, if you want, if you want to help me out, if there's any questions, I think this is about the time when I'm supposed to to slow it down, although I didn't get my 15 minute warning. So how am I doing moderators? Doing good? Okay. Yeah, we're, we're doing good on time. We've got about eight minutes left at this point. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and read you the questions and if you, you could answer them one at a time, that would be great. Sure. Uh, first one that we had received was, will the slides be available online? Oh, okay, sure. I'm sure they are. And I think they're recording this session as well. And not only that, I'll make them available on the Women in VR website as well, which, you know, I'm a founding member with Maria. So, okay. Do you have a link that you could drop into local on that, please? Yeah, Maria just put wivr.net. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, second question we had is Are you getting any traction in the agile world? Uh, so Agile is a, is a very interesting term, and I bet that came from you, Agile Bill. Um, but <laughs> the uh, <laughs> just, a, just a wild guess on my part. Um, so yes, yes, we are. Um, but we are used in Agile not just for software development. So I think um, those of us that are sort of steeped in technology have a tendency to say the word Agile with software at the other end of it. But Agile process and Agile teaming, Agile package design, uh, you know, so so if you can substitute red teaming for agile, um, then yes, we are getting much traction in that area. Okay, great. Uh, third question we have is how do you address it when someone dismisses VR by saying this looks like a game? Yeah, so that was, I hope, the forcefulness with which I talked about the total uh, doing that cost benefit analysis. Um, so it is soft dollars and hard dollars. Now, there's a lot of research that can support you in this, but soft dollars are worth, you know, usually what the, what's the number? I think 10x what a hard dollar is. So hard dollars is money, I can tell you. And ten, that people tend to say, well, if you use this environment, you won't travel. And that just doesn't fly anymore in enterprise, right? Because they were told that when we got WebEx and Adobe Connect and same time and all these other tools, right? So you, you got to be really conscious of how you're doing your benefits analysis. So when we work in urban redesign, we, for example, work with the mayor's office and say, you're, you're gonna be more accessible to your constituencies, right? Like you're looking for where, where their charm is. So when I tell you really speak their language, there is no shortcut. You have to know what you're selling and to whom you're selling and you have to give them the cost benefit analysis. 
So I, I, there's never a panacea for this. It's always hard work, right? And, but it's fantastic if you, if you put one together, they're gonna go, oh my God. Now we, we in the construction industry have a great example of one. And it is like within the first three weeks, uh, construction companies using our platform can save all kinds of money. And within X numbers of months, they can save millions on their construction. And all of that work is supported by the amazing research that Dr. Uh, Renate Fuchter does at the PBL lab at Stanford. So it's not like I'm, I am saying this. This has been proved out. Sure, go ahead to the next one. Okay, um, our next question we have. Um, do you ever get people saying, I have seen VR come and go, it's just a fad and will come and go again? Yes, I mean, that's a wonderful question. And and uh, yeah, totally, it's tough because this was probably during the talk um, that I was trying to say, look, the notion that our consumer wave. So when we got the mobile phones uh, as a researcher in innovation, that flipped it. It used to be that enterprise pushed what the world uses into consumer and when mobile phones came around, it flipped it and consumers push what enterprise uses. And so as we see more demand for 3D content because of that's how we're entertained, it becomes less and less the burden of why the heck would I want uh, you know, 3D anything? But I mean, you wanna watch your terms, right? So VR means a lot of things to a lot of people, right? And you, you know, to you, it might have meant oh, heads up display or a grid or, you know, but it's, you know, anything immersive, right? So, yeah. So I think, I think you have to fight that battle. Um, and um, I tend to also use strategy techniques such as showing the supply and demand and how we're past the cross point. Um, so I use good business research, like support when I present, otherwise you're just going to, I, I, you're going to get that. And if you stand there and look at them blinking your eyes and don't have an answer for that, then shame on you. So, yeah. Okay. Um, next couple kind of are related, so I'll group them together. Um, one is uh, how can you get customers to serve as references and are you finding it hard to get them to understand the monetary value? Um, okay. Um, so the monetary value thing, I was trying to just, just address in the last one, but um, how do I get customers? So this is not, um, so I'm gonna lean on my being a woman, you know, who I was the first entrepreneur in residence at Simmons Postgraduate MBA Entrepreneurship Program. So, so the reality is that um, when you sign up customers, the first thing you want to do as a as a as a business owner or as a, as their sales lead or something like that is one thing is you never want just one customer. Second is you want to find a way to offer them a reason why they want to be you know referenceable. And so if you have to do it with a discount, you do it with a discount. But you know you have to pay your bills, right? But so appeal you have to appeal to them, and that's just business acumen, right? So the business acumen is. I, you know, I'm going to make you famous, right? I, I've done, I've used that one. Uh, you, I'll give talks with you. I'll write your talk. You go give it, right? I don't, I don't have to have acumen. I don't have to have accolades. I want you to buy from me, right? So you put, if you can shelf your ego and write talks for people that want to be famous in organizations, then that'll help you out. Yeah. So there's all these techniques that you do in sort of business 101 to try and get people to sign up to, to allow you to speak for them. And then there are just companies that won't let you do it. You notice I say top 10, you know, fortune 10 company, because there's a couple in there, I am still not allowed to say it. And, you know, they're in retail and things like that, but you just can't say it. And, um, and then you just, you can't. Um, <laughs> Faith is well, laughing. So that's good. Well, thank you so much, Julie, for a terrific presentation. Um, as a reminder to our audience, you can see what's coming up on the conference schedule at conference.opensimulator.org. Following this session at 11 a.m., we have a break in the schedule for lunch or dinner, uh, depending on where you are in the physical world. Uh, we also encourage you to visit the Story Wheel exhibit. It's in the Education 2 region to view a tool that was created back in the 16th century. It's called the Books Wheel which can be thought of kind of like a precursor of the modern day website. In addition, if you are a crowd funder at the exclusive access level or above, you are invited to a VIP Q&A session with today's keynote speakers in the staff zone auditorium at 11 a.m. And finally, we'll return after the lunch break in the keynote regions for an exciting keynote address from Philip Rosedale of High Fidelity. And Philip will be attempting to answer the question, what is the metaverse? 
Thank you again to our speaker and the audience, and we'll be back after lunch. Have a terrific break.
Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 10 a.m. session in the Business and Energy. Thank you. 